G'day. A month ago, I worked at Netflix. In fact, very, very recently, I worked at Netflix. I recently joined Intel. I'm on day five of Intel. In fact, I was at Netflix for eight years and a month, and certainly felt like taking a month or two off between jobs. But LSFMM was within like a week of leaving Netflix, so I had to just come straight from one job to the next. So that's why I'm on Intel day five and not currently in my break between two jobs. I'm going to talk about two topics. The first is about BPF observability tools, the sort of things I'm working on at the cutting edge to get your feedback and help with some problems. And a wish list to find out where we're at. And then the other topic is the guidelines. It's something the BPF steering committee we've been trying to, well, I've been trying to get done. The first topic about BPF observability is while I've created all these great low-level tools for SSHing onto systems and running them, that's not the number one thing people will use for BPF observability. The killer feature is flame graphs. In fact, Intel just acquired a startup called Granulate that were doing eBPF flame graph profiling. And there are various other ones. There's Optimize and there's others as well, Prodfiler. What's great about eBPF is that we can frequency count the on CPU stack trace and then emit just the frequency count to user space, turn that into a flame graph. It's really efficient versus using, say, perf to do all the samples down to user space and then having user space to the aggregation. Even though perf has all these optimizations, which actually makes it a lot better than it could have been, but it makes on CPU profiling more efficient and more of this product that startups are now selling. Also, off-CPU profiling. It will make off-CPU profiling practical at all, because without eBPF and the, the aggregations and, and things it can do, off-CPU profiling was not practical. So I've spent a lot of time on this, because this is going to be what a lot of startups adopt. And this is, this is what a lot of people are going to experience as their first taste of eBPF for observability. And then later on, they might try my tools, or they'll use a, a UI on top of them. So one problem we had at Netflix is that with sampling stack traces, even though the kernel could put them into a map and then frequency count them, we'd still have scenarios of having something like 30,000 unique stack traces going to user space. And then user space would do the symbol translation and it would take a very long time to emit a flame graph. And so this became a bottleneck. And so I noticed that the top level instruction offset, we didn't really care about. Sometimes we care about it. I want to know what instruction I'm stuck on. But for the flame graph level, like you, don't, you can't even see it because we just I turned that into a rectangle. So my idea was to discuss how can we chop off this bit. It's just a few characters. Can't I just use like said and like take it off? Well, no, because in kernel space, it's just a list of numbers. And so what I'm really trying to do is take the current instruction pointer and go to the start of the function with no symbols <laughs> for user space code while you're in kernel space in BPF context. Can it be done? This was, where, this was where I thought this is a great thing to discuss. It's like, wouldn't it be great if we could have a BPF function get start, and you give it the IP, and it's like, here's the start address. Because then I can use BPF get stack ID, skip the first frame, and then I have what I'm after, which is this, without the, the top level offset, right? I haven't actually tried this. I haven't tried the, I'm, sh I'm sure this works, where you skip the, because Alexi put it in there, He's, you can skip the first few frames, right? You've got a bit mask. Okay, so this, it sounds like this all should work. Like BPF already has this capability. We just need, need to be able to do this. It will reduce the unique stacks by a factor of 12 to 15 times. I took some old profiles and I, and I summarized it and yeah, it turns out it's because your, uh, that's about the average function length for production workloads that I was looking at. And it's because you're just chopping off the offset and you're just reducing it to one. So instead of sampling each of those off instruction offsets, you've just got zero. 
And so I had a few ideas. Anyone have an idea of doing this? So I want this. I know I've got that. So what I've been hacking up today, the problem with giving a, a talk at LSFMM and saying, oh, here's problems I couldn't solve, is I feel guilty and lazy. It's like I should try and solve them before I talk about them. And so I've been trying to solve this, and I'll give a demonstration of it. All right, so I'm profiling Bash in one window. And in the other window, I've got my tool. And so I've got on the left, this is the instruction pointer, hash search. And on the right, I've chopped off the offset and just turned it into the parent function so that we can aggregate on that. And it mostly works. Don't look too closely. <laughs> mostly works. How did I do this? Purely in BPF for user space. In fact, I'm printing out some aggregations at the bottom. And you can see how trimmed. The trimmed array is smaller than the normal array because I've got fewer things. So I'll tell you how I did it. And you can tell me if this is just wrong and <laughs> it's working by accident. So my rough proof of concept is I, this is all in BPF trace. I go to the RBP, and then I walk backwards five bytes and have a look at the opcode. If that's E8, it's a call instruction. I then look at the next four bytes for the relative and then add it to the parent function. And ta-da, there's the start of the top level frame. So I'm basically walking down a frame, going backwards, and disassembling the call. <laughs> hmm. yeah, and it's a direct, it's only like you're talking about direct calls, right? Like indirect phone work. Sure, sure. I, I, like, I broke this today like, yeah. <laughs> while you were talking, sorry. But like this can be longer, like I can add a few more, I can like do other architectures and instructions. But tell me if this is insane, because I will abandon this. But tell me if this just seems like a bad idea. Like I said, it seems to work. I've tried it for like 30 seconds. The benefit is we can use this to do CPU flame graphs and reduce the, the emitted uh, stacks by 15-fold. It would be great. There is, the, there is the instruction pointer, and then the, you, I'm just trying to see what is going on there. It works, it works. It works for, like, yeah, for, for direct calls, it works. <laughs> <laughs> for direct calls, I, I know, I need to do the table of like other instructions and like. But, but there are all sorts of horny cases, like tail calls, indirect calls, like it's super fragile, <laughs> but like you can use it. So like, as Alexi said, there's lots of other instructions, like there's different call, call types, uh, indirect calls. Uh, as an observability tool, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. I just have to document somewhere that it's like, this is mostly right, and that's fine. Security tools have to be 100% accurate. Anyway, that's the first topic. Other but, comments but on this idea? Idea, idea is interesting, so, but we should probably get, uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to see whether we already have something like this. The helper that will find the beginning based on the address inside the function will uh, give the first Byte. Uh, we might have one. Maybe not. If not, we can add it. That would definitely help. Yeah, and like, this is my quick tool, and it's like, look, it kind of works. Like, internal malloc, and I've chopped off the offset, internal malloc. That didn't work. But then it wasn't an E8, so I'm like doing the wrong instruction. So I need to fill out my table. And so that didn't work for some reason, I need to figure out. Don't look too closely. There's still like more code needs to be added. But there should be no blocker of like if we need to add a new helper that is dedicated to this specifically, it should be fine, right? That'd be great. I don't wanna, I don't want to make you add lots of helpers, like because I can turn that into like a user space macro somewhere in BCC or BPF trace. But yeah, having a a helper, BPF get function start, and then we can hide all the different architectures. 
So do we need to do this in the NMI when we do the trigger, or it could be after a little bit later? Because that's, I'm afraid you, to, to get accurate, we're gonna do the binary search, which is probably a little bit expensive. <laughs> Well, if we're already working, I mean, we're already working stacks in the NMI, if we're doing NMI-based profiling, and like the Netflix production, the production stacks go to 1,000 frames deep, which is why Analdo added the perf max stack CDL, because our stacks are so deep. So yeah, that, I think that that's a good concern. Like, I'm doing too much stuff in an NMI handler, but we've already broken that. And can I do it after the NMI? Depends if, if the user space thread got rescheduled and the instruction point is somewhere else now. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think we, we can definitely give it a try. I mean, oh, maybe we just keep the first uh, address and do the lookup later or maybe have a post process or something, I don't know. It's, uh, it's not easy enough to, to give it a try and we'll see how, how fast or how slow it is. <laughs> You can keep talking about that. Next problem, missing context. So stack traces, fantastic, plain graphs, I can understand, big picture of my code, but it's missing stuff, like the database query string. And so the code answers, it's supposed to answer why, like why am I here, and why is my code on CPU, or why am I calling this stuff? But that'll be useful, database query string, or like user IDs, or whatever, like Netflix movie title you're watching, Whatever it is. You can do this today via tracing and stashing. So I trace the start of something and stash it to the thread ID, and then when I sample, I include it, and then I clear it. But I want to do it just in sampling. I want to make this lower overhead. I don't want to have to do tracing. And so things to discuss. So, so you understand that the goal here is I want to see these stack traces and I want to add like a frame of context, like this is the database query string or the thing you're working on. So trace and stash, that's one way. I can do a double walk. So I did prototype this in BPF trace and it works. <laughs> and that's where I do a quick stack walk until I get to a frame that has the context and then I fetch the context, and then I follow it with the normal BPF stack walkers. So I'm basically diving as quick as I can, just go down to the, and, and when I get into the um, IP uh, instruction pointer range between my low and high, go do my context fetch from the other arguments of the function if they're available on the stack, and so that, because that will work entirely from, from sampling context. I just do a quick walk, grab the context, then I do the full stack walk. Ta-da, I've got it without tracing. Can you, sorry, I'm lost. <laughs> um, which, uh, what's, what is context? How do you know this IP range and why context is there? So MySQL is a nice example because they've got like do, uh, um, do command and, and query and join and all, all the functions and a lot of the, Query strings are available as char stars. So if you can access the argument to the function, you've got the query string. But the big problem is that that only sometimes works for the registers that are on the stack. So if the register isn't on the stack, I can't fetch the argument. If it is on the stack, I can fetch the argument. Uh. Still missing. So you're talking about user process yep. stack, right? But you, so you have to, like this walking logic has to be very specific to a particular binary, right? So it has to like have a built-in knowledge that this is like a stack trace potentially of MySQL or whatever, walk from whatever it's stopped until some lower frame, and if this lower frame is a certain function that you know will be in that binary and that address, then you will look in like addresses, et cetera. Sure. Absolutely, so the two things is, as Alexi said, this is very specific to the application. Sure, so like in BPF trace or BCC or whatever, we have some sort of API so that you can define, 
here's the MySQL walker, and here's the Erlang walker, and here's the memcached or walker, or whatever. And people can add, write their own little walkers and plugins to get the context. The other thing is to, I want to add a syscall called, this is my context, like do context syscall, which has a char star. And then I tell application developers, before you do your slow, not the hot path, I'm not saying add it to hot path, but for the slow path, do a syscall, or just save it in a, a known memory address of the string context so that debuggers can go and fetch it. Could this just be like, a, you, could you use a register somewhere and save at uh, context? No? I mean, if... Or annotate in your like application code, this is context and this is somehow handled by the... Uh, yeah, if we, can, if we can modify application code, this is solved. Because we can do it so, we can, like application memory walk, we could say, just stick it in this memory address where we know where it is. Each thread populates that memory address. We just go fetch it. The MySQL helper will go and fetch it from the MySQL context address, and we're done. So syscall would require application modification. Well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything's going to, either, if you get really lucky and you can just walk through memory, like if, has anyone done core dump analysis without registers and you like, I don't know, maybe it's memory's cool. over here and then you can like figure it out? Maybe like what, what about for key application functions you have on your slow path, on the entry point of the function where you know that we're going to populate, uh, we're going to do some heavy stuff, you attach a trampoline of some sort and start saving context there rather than modifying the application. It totally works, totally works. Oh, trace, and my, and my, MySQL is slow enough, I'd actually just do that for MySQL. Yeah. I just trace like do command and then save the string. It's just more higher frequent. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if there was a way I could sample this for higher frequency things that didn't, didn't need that. So do you, do you have an example like context like MySQL? Is it a system call like reading a file or? or sending some level traffic. Because some, some, something could be asynchronous, right? It could be related to that process, but maybe it's a asynchronous, asynchronous code path. Could be synchronous code path. Things like node.js really mess things up with the event worker thread. Uh, it's nice, things like MySQL are nice in that they will do a thread for a, a connection and then handle that query. And so you can tie things to the thread ID. But if it's synchronous, then you're going to have to find an, a key address to match the context with. It becomes more complicated. If it is synchronous, you may be, for example, writing to a file, or I don't know, sending out to send message to a socket. Maybe you can store something in the task, local storage, and then maybe you can get it from there. Yeah, if you, if you mean if you can modify the application, put things in task lo local storage, and then and then, yeah, and like have a have a well-defined macro that we publish, and we tell people when you add your probes, tracing probes, you should also add this context. Context, not a probe, is it? But when you Con trace, when you trace it, for example, send message or write to a file, when you trace it, maybe a trace point, you should be able to get a current task. You add it there, you get a current task. You know the PID of the task for the MySQL, then at that point maybe you, be, you can do something. Sorry, yeah, when, when you trace it, you, you have the process ID. There is a way to do... You know you even can get a current task structure. At that point you can store something in there. So when you go down to the stat, it, it, at the top of the stat is something that you want to tag, then you can tag it there by using the current, current task storage, for example. But asynchronous will be, I don't know how to do asynchronous. But I wonder in this context, like when you need to maybe debug some production issue and then you don't have that thing stored in that context that you want to have, it's maybe a, also tricky, right? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I haven't really dealt with this problem on Linux, but on Windows and WinDBG, I had to write scripts into WinDBG to grab my context. It was heavily application specific, like because I was unrolling like a stack and an interpreter inside of a win uh, like a, a C program, and we we to to debug. That's what we had to do, uh, and it required like a full blown scripting language to support it. Is it possible to use uh, like the information from Dolph or other information to help you 
to pass where is the context, for example, argument, function argument. You basically can use the dwarf information to extract that. But I know that the performance is a, an issue, but it's a possible if we do that uh, after war uh, to analyze. And maybe we just keep capture part of a stack frame, and uh, later we can use dwarf information to pass that, the part context. Yeah, I mean, Dwarf has lots of stuff. I just worry that the request will be done by the time we're looking it up, and Dwarf will help us understand. I wonder if we can use Dwarf to help um, develop the double walker. Because like I said, the, the first six, on x86, the first six registers are not on the stack. But Dwarf knows where they are. So maybe I can use Dwarf information to come up with how do I... Because with MySQL, it's such a nice example. You've got the char star as like arg0. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure I can't do this method. But if Dwarf told me where that was... I, I think if you, if maybe you that genericize the walker, it would probably be the appropriate. OK. So that, as I think of it, that might actually be the best way to do it, is you have like a BPF trace or BCC way of other people publishing their own basically context widget. and. You know, people can write one for, for MySQL and the Hadoop and Apache Spark. And like, its API is to populate a context variable based on the thread ID, so long as it's synchronous to the thread. And that's it. And you just let people add their context walkers, and then the profiler will check if that's populated. Maybe that's the best way to do this. Um, could you go forward one slide, please? So. At Meta, we do a lot of A and C, um, occasionally in combination. Uh, I'm actually bummed that Andre had to step out because he effectively wrote uh, a Meta internal version of what you want for C, like the custom macro uh, that the BPF program can then find very easily. Uh, rather, a custom macro that populates the ELF uh, and then some code that at profiling time or tracing time uh, tells the BPF program where to find the context that okay. it's stored. It sounds like that, that is this. Yes. So that, I want that open source so I can use it. He's been, like, he's been bugging it, people to open source it. Uh, I, do, I believe that the way that it currently works is it uh, basically reverse engineers thread local storage for various architectures. Okay. And we can also use that to sort of uh, associate what threads are doing work, for example, on behalf of a certain request you know, using request ID. And then we will occasionally use that in concert with A uh, to associate sort of uh, metadata that is known at the end of a request that may not be known at the beginning. Uh, for example, the latency, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's something we kind of have working internally, more or less. And we've gotten requests uh, for the B version of this. Uh, so I think that would be useful as well. So who is it and what's it called? <laughs> Uh, Andre did the original, the original did the implementation. Original. Uh, it's called Strobe Meta. We Strobe might have Strobe some self-tests okay. that are sort of related, but he was definitely on my case within the last year about open sourcing it. Uh, how, do you, how do you bind the request ID to the thread ID? I missed I miss something. The request ID to the thread ID. Um, well, in this scenario, you don't need. Well, it's not. It's not. It's yeah. The official thing is not open source, but it is in self-test in not in reduced form. So if you look at it, like it's doing all sorts of crazy works, uh, different data structures, and it does look sort of like a local storage, and it knows more or less just because it knows where things are. <laughs> yeah. It's but it's specific to the like. It's custom to the application, so there is no like complete like generality. Yeah, like in, in our specific case, we have some request context thing with its own. Uh, it's so your application knows that this, this thing is run, BPF program is running, it caches the request ID somewhere for the thread to, for the BPF program to read? The application will essentially always populate uh, these memory regions. Uh, and when the BPF program is starting up, or rather the user space piece is starting up, it will find the running executables. Uh, with a specific ELF section that this macro populates. And it, it requires that a single thread 
handles that entire request, basically. No, not necessarily. Or when it does the handoff, the application has to rewrite the correct rewrite the thread ID through. Yep. Sounds cool. One other thing I haven't explored is, can the hardware help, like processor trace? Because processor trace can trace branches and then pull out arguments. If it can somehow basically keep in memory the first six uh, register addresses, first six registers, uh, that we can, I can then look up on the fly from BPF, that might be another way to get to those arguments. I haven't looked at that yet. Just an idea. Another topic on stack traces is off CPU sampled stacks. How, we're current, how Netflix is currently doing it is event tracing using the off CPU tools in BCC. And the problem is scheduler tracing can be frequent. It can be doing over a million events a second. It can be doing over two million events a second on the system. That can start to add up to be 1% or 2% CPU. If we can sample instead of trace, sample off CPU stacks, we could take that down to, I'm estimating 9,000 samples a second. If say you're, you're looking at one application with 1,000 threads and you're sampling at nine hertz, something gentle, then you could really cut this down, which would be great. A problem with the stuff I've played with is so many of these application threads are idle doing nothing so you end up, and, and Netflix has stacks that can be a thousand frames deep. So you end up walking these deep stacks over and over and over that haven't changed. So the idea is to only fetch stacks after wake-ups. So find something in task struct that will tell me if this thread has not budged since I last sampled the stack trace. Uh, which I think I can use get the get our usage stuff because that gets updated. I think I've tried this before and there was some problem with it. But there's got to be some flag, else add a flag, there's got to be some flag in task struct that will tell me, has this thread woken up and been scheduled since I last looked? The runnable, the runnable stuff, like the, 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 there is, there is uh, accounting from the scheduler side on how, how much time does it spend on a CPU. Yeah, so that's, you could that's just... in get our usage maps to it. Yeah, so I think that should be what you could use, right? Like... Yeah, I tried this once and hit a problem. But there's other stuff, there's, time, there's all sorts of stuff in task struct. You need to go through it and get the thing that works. Hopefully it works. And then each time you look at an idle thread, you know if it's woken up or not. And if it hasn't woken up, you just use the cached stack ID and then resave that, so you don't have to recall BPF get stack. Does this sound like a good idea? So anyway, this is my idea of, of making this more efficient. Since I've been changing jobs, I haven't actually coded it yet, but I was going to use BPF get stack ID, and for some reason I thought I could point this at other threads. I now forget why I thought that. Anyone, anyone tell me I'm on the wrong direction? I'll play with it. I, I, when, last time I really dug into the weeds, I thought this should work. This should totally work. We don't need to change BPF. I can point it to other threads and then do off CP sampling, also known as wall time profiling, and we're done efficiently. So that's the plan. Something else in terms of BPF observability is, since we meet six months and, and every six months and talk about the same things, is anyone actually working on the U-probe speed up stuff that we keep talking about at Plumbers? Hands up if anyone is doing the Dynast U-probe speed ups. Nobody, okay. Because I keep, people keep emailing me saying, Brendan, I'm trying to use U-probes in this application, it's really slow. It's like, yes, you've volunteered to do the work. But so far, I haven't convinced anyone to do the work. We know we've got to get U-probes to be faster so that it opens the door to all sorts of things. The second one is anyone working on heap tracing. So if you want to do U-probes on Java or other jittered runtimes, you need to be able to point U-probes at the heap segment and trace methods there. 
and it doesn't currently allow it because it's not an executable segment and it doesn't have a backing store. Is anyone working on fixing that right now? Someone at Meta really wants this, so when we discussed it a few days ago, I, I poked him about it. We really want to do the heap tracing into jitted memory. Oh, I heard Meta's going to release this soon. Great. <laughs> I didn't awesome. say that, but... <laughs> so, good. Looking forward to using it. I mean, if, if you're interested in this kind of thing, I did ask the Oracle JVM developers a while ago to give me the capability to pause the C2 compiler. So we can pause the C2 compiler. We can then go, once this is done, we can then go uprobe Java methods. And once the speed up is done, it'll actually make sense. And then we can do all sorts of things instead of using our well, Netflix's bespoke collection of various Java tools. It can all just be BPF to do like memory leak detection and profiling and all, all sorts of stuff can just become an eBPF program. But that's some of the building blocks. The last thing, is anyone working on, so stack walking, like it's great when it works, is anyone working on an eBPF way to merge all the different stack walking methods? That's not all of them, but some of them. You won't believe this, but someone from Meta. <laughs> great, good. <laughs> About, I think about a year and a half ago, someone from Meta did a trial of uh, merging LBR and frame pointer uh, stacks. And it seemed to work pretty good. I don't know if we kept it turned on, but it was at least iterated on quite a bit. So I can check the state of that. That would be good. That would be awesome. So Meta, Meta for, for, and also like, why not? You're here as well. You may as well do U-Probe speed up, right? <laughs> Let me do all the things. I was going to talk about tools, but there's, from my perspective, there's actually not a lot to talk about. There hasn't, we haven't merged that many new tools recently. That's not a bad thing. To make great tools, you need great problems. And so we do get various submissions where people have taken, say, trace points and they're formatting them in a different way. But there seems to be the absence of a real production problem to solve with it. So. We haven't merged, we've merged some interesting ones, but not too many recently. I do, I will talk about uh, BCC and maintainership with Dave and Yung Hong. Is there any particular issues you want to summarize? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard work to tell people like, your tool isn't suitable, you need to do this, you need to do that. It's just ongoing maintenance. Is there any updates you feel we should briefly mention? BCC and BPF trace tools. Well, selfless, selfish plug, I guess. Uh, now we have used the support in libpf, so it's possible to convert more tools to like purely libpf slash core. Like <laughs> I those. get I get so many GitHub like emails about the conversions. Are, are they there's still some that haven't been ported? Oh, there are like forty one or forty three tools that are converted, and there are about fifty that are not. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought we were much closer. So we're only like halfway through well, moving. So if you've played with B, BCC, Python is the old interface. We want to go to the libbpf, C, BTF, and core interface. Some tools take a heavy advantage of like Clank compilation at runtime. So like trace.py is like, I assume is super hard to port to libbpf. Some were relying on USDT and some either no one is using actively, or I don't know, maybe there are some other complications I haven't checked. Yung Hung, other main issues to summarize? Nope. Uh, just some general comments about maintaining the tools. Um, for a while, I've wanted to find a way to get people who are experts in the specific thing the tool is trying to trace uh, to take a more active role in maintainership. Because I don't know, Yong Hong, if you would agree, but about 90% of the issues and pull requests we get are related to the tools. And specifically when we get pull requests where people are, are adding some feature, it's generally about some tool that we're not particularly invested in. So we're inclined to just say yes and not push back, which you know over time is not going to end in a good state. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the, the comment was we, we want to get the experts to do the tools because that's the best tools. And if any subsystem you've worked on the, in the kernel, think about what tool can you write for your own subsystem? 
So like Daniel, you did, was it DCTP protocol? Yeah, so where's DCTP, DCTP stat and DCTP snoop and DCTP errors? And you're the best person to do it because you wrote it, right? <laughs> They're running it. So, so like I worked on ZFS, so I did the ZFS tools. It's, if, if you've worked on a particular subsystem, you're in the best position to write, here's the, here's the tool, because you know the internal bits and the bits that matter for performance and debugging. So yes, we need to, we need to get more of the real, the, the authors of the code to instrument their own code, come up with uh, performance tools. It's almost like maybe, because we're doing fairly well on getting engineers to provide unit tests when they do pull requests. How about BPF trace programs as well? It's like, yes, do the tests and the instrumentation. So maybe that's something I should start fighting for. I recalled another like sort of blocker inconvenience for like BCC to libpf conversion. Like any tool that does heavy use of uh, stack traces, especially user space stack traces, that's kind of hard right now because we don't have like a nice library for stack traces symbolization. Like capturing stack traces is like, yeah, BPF gets stack, right? But the symbolizing them is, is a little bit of a problem. For like KL sims, we have some helpers. For you, prob, it, it's kind of a little bit harder, and especially if you want to do like inline function and all stuff. But guess what? Meta is working on. <laughs> I'm, I'm sticking, I'm like, I'm going as quick as I can. Let me type it in. And it's uh, kernel user space symbol. Yeah, basically, symbolization library. And you can fit the, like, the org LBR stack traces, like non-frame pointer stack traces, like, into kind of similar space, right? Like, how do we get stack trace, and how do we make, make it human comprehensible. So, but like with this, can you do the, can you define the user space symbolization and then have the kernel do the work? No, because of dwarf. Well, let's not use dwarf. Like we've got BTF, we should have user BTF. Uh, like the inline functions, right? It's dwarf does good job representing it compactly, it's just complicated format. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I don't think so. Like, okay, we have kernel folks here, right? Like, do we even imagine having like inline functions, debug information supported natively by kernel for BPF programs? It'd be good to. Yonkwan says no, so unlikely. It'd be it'd be good just to have an interface for not just KL sims, but like for this process, here's its symbol tables. Um, something you just do for the number one application process so the kernel has a, can do its own quick lookups. Elf symbol is not hard, yes. But then, then you have to deal with putting user space out, uh, strings out to user space, because we're just doing, anyway. Okay, things Meta is working on. I've fixed the slide. 